Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session on strategic shifts in energy. My name is Vijay Vaitiswaran. I'm the China business editor for The Economist magazine. It's my great pleasure and honor to moderate this session of very distinguished panelists um, drawn from uh, the energy world from around the world. I'll introduce them very briefly in uh, uh, going to my left here. Uh, since we're in a circle, really, there's no uh, right or wrong way to do this. But uh, to my immediate left, uh, Gao Jifan, chairman and CEO of Trina Solar here in China. Uh, following on to my left, Khalid Al-Fali, president and CEO of Saudi Aramco. We have Simon Henry, chief financial officer of Royal Dutch Shell. And we have uh, Lin Bo Chiang, director of the Center for Energy Economics Research at Xiamen University here in China. Please give them a nice round of applause. So this session, uh, very importantly, is on the record. It is open to reporting press. It is being webcast live. And in fact, I am told that there is at least uh, one person attending by remote beam technology, which you might see behind me, uh, uh, whose telepresence is here, even if the person themselves can't be. And I'm sure several other people are here by ESP and other means. So don't say anything you don't want broadcast everywhere in the world. <laughs> Do say very interesting and provocative things. Those are my, my rules. Uh, we are going to modify the usual rule about turn off all your mobile devices in the following way. Put them on silent mode. Do keep them on connect whatever your connectivity is, Wi-Fi or cellular, because we're going to start with an opinion poll. We want to do a, uh, get a pulse of the room. So bring out your Blackberries, Crackberries, Pinkberries, any other devices that are normally annoying people at meetings. And on this occasion, join in. If you look at the screens around the room, you'll see a, a URL that you can go to. And we'll do a, a couple of questions. Uh, when when uh, I get a sense that people are ready, ready to go, I see people still reaching in their pockets, turning on their phones, etc. But the first question is really just a trial question, of course, just to get, the, get a sense of how, how we're doing here. Okay, why don't we start the polling? Um, if you're at the URL, please go ahead and select what region are you from. And we'll let the polling go for a little while, and I'll, I'll ask for it to stop in just a moment. Is there anyone who's not able to get to the URL? Raise your hands if you're having problems. OK, if you're having problems, staff will come over. I see a lot of people over there having problems as well. Um, anyone behind me having problems getting to the URL on the screen around you to do the polling? <coughs> OK, all right. Well, some people will come around and try to help you. We'll, we'll see the, we're seeing some results already. So there we go. Hands up, how many people still having problems? Okay, I see a gentleman back there, but we'll have staff coming around. Okay, why don't we stop, stop this um, test vote? I think uh, we're, we're seeing enough fluctuation in votes that we can, we can move on. <clears throat> All right. Um, while we get the last of the technical issues sorted out, I just wanted to set the frame a little bit. Um, you know, it seems to me the energy world is at a crossroads today. And that's really why we're here to discuss some of the strategic shifts. We're um, at an interesting moment in geopolitics uh, in, in, uh, in different ways, partly strictly arising out of uh, uh, political decisions, but also uh, mm. economic decisions, what we can call geoeconomics, we'll talk about a little bit during our session, as well as uh, disruptive technologies that are coming on and bus business models associated with disruptions. Usually it's not the technology, of course, that's disruptive. It's being wrapped around a business model that creates value that makes it so disruptive. And we're seeing those also challenge some established and incumbent lines of business. Um, and so we'll be picking up on these themes to discuss how that uh, broad question is playing out for some of the most important actors on the energy stage. We'll talk about some of the decarbonizing technologies that are on the table. And we'll discuss unconventional oil and gas in our time together as well. Uh, now, we have only an hour, so that's a lot to cover. Um, but let's, again, let's try uh, getting a pulse of the room. Let's put up our first question uh, for the group. What do you think is the most important driver of strategic shifts in the energy sector today? 
energy geopolitics, decarbonizing technologies and climate policies, unconventional oil and gas, demand factors, other. All right, I'll give you another 10 seconds and then we'll wind up the voting. All right, let's have the results. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Well, there's an outcome that hadn't been forecast, but it's good to see there's going to be a, a real robust debate. Um, we were thinking about using your results to lead off to other questions on that specific theme, drilling down and spending the whole hour on the exact topic you wanted, but it's going to be a bit more freewheeling than that. Let's scrap the second question. Let's just delve right into our experts then. We can see the audience is of a mixed mind on what exactly is changing the energy world. Um, let's see. Why don't we um, uh, perhaps start... Uh, since we do have uh, the head of the world's largest oil company here with us, um, maybe I can, I can start with you. Um, uh, Khaled Al-Fali, uh, tell us, uh, as you see the, the geopolitics uh, evolving right now, certainly uh, we're seeing um, Russia on the global stage, tensions with Europe. Uh, we see alliance perhaps strengthening with China on the energy front. Um, and also we're seeing, in a sense, North American energy uh, if not independent, something in that direction, thanks to the shale revolution, and people questioning whether America might remain engaged in the Middle East um, as its uh, historic reliance on oil imports from that region diminish. Give us your perspective on uh, the Middle East's role in geopolitics and energy and how it's shifting. Well, uh, geopolitics, first of all, is nothing new uh, to energy or oil. It's been with us since oil was uh, discovered and traded and uh, used to power economies. In fact, if you go back to the World War I and II, you will find that oil was a key part of uh, global conflict. So I think what you're seeing today is a continuation. Our commodity, whether we like it or not, our business, our products, are the most political of all businesses and all commodities. Uh, the Middle East is central uh, to oil, despite the recent uh, trend of uh, the shale oil and tight oil production out of the U.S., the Middle East remains the biggest source of conventional oil. 50% of oil reserves uh, are spread in the Middle East uh, and North Africa, and a significant amount of gas is... Uh, also uh, uh, in the Middle East, especially uh, in the Gulf region. So really the, the role of the Middle East uh, remains central. North America is part of the global economy. The U.S. prices are linked uh, to global prices. So what happens in the Middle East impacts the U.S. today as much as it did before. So really what I'm hearing is, uh, rather than independence, a message of interdependence. Uh, that the Middle East still has lots of resources, particularly in the conventional area, but uh, interdependence and global markets is what I'm hearing from you. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, what about the, um, uh, the challenge of rising costs? Um, you know, people have talked about peak oil. That's been perhaps forecast a bit too early, uh, but there's no denying that the cost of lifting is increasing, and with it, the cost to you and your firm and your economy. Does that diminish your ability to play uh, the role of the swing producer, which has been Saudi Arabia's stabilizing and pleasing role for the world economy. In a sense, you have kept the world from numerous global crises uh, by acting as a shock absorber. Is that ability to perform that role diminished because the lifting cost and the curve of peak oil is making it harder for you to do so? We're far from uh, peak oil, VJ. I mean, uh, reserves are, it's well known that there are reserves for generations to come at current production levels, especially with, uh, with the shale resource being uh, within reach technically. Uh, so I think it's a question of demand being there to incentivize uh, added production and added capacity. 
I spoke recently at a conference in Norway, and I, and I talked about the fact that in the next two decades, we need 40 million barrels of new capacity, that the reserves are there to support it. But the costs are going to be very, very high, which you uh, alluded to. And therefore, healthy prices need to be in place to support bringing that capacity to the market. Uh, we in Saudi Arabia have the lowest cost uh, by far compared to any major producer. So we're in the single digits, low single digits, in terms of our total cost of production, including capital. But a lot of the marginal barrels that are required to meet uh, current demand or rising demand are not even supported by current prices. So I think prices have to be there. Costs have to be managed. We've seen cost of lifting, as you refer to, in uh, regional areas like deep Arctic to be uh, in the 100 plus dollar range uh, to take the risks and, and the total capital and operating costs. So I think they will need to be robust prices going forward. And capacity of the companies to, uh, and the supply chain of the oil industry to bring that capacity to market. Projects also require very long planning horizon, 10 years or so just to bring a project from sure. conception to production. So people need to see the clarity of the market regulations and a healthy price going forward well, let, in order let me to finance that project. On that point, um, the, the long term uh, nature of what you talked about. Uh, you know, um, Simon, your company, uh, Shell, is famous for its long term scenarios uh, that you produce every so often, uh, looking into the future, your scenario planning exercises. Um, uh, can you look into the crystal ball and tell us, picking up on the themes that we've heard from, um, from Khaled Al Fali, uh, in a world in which oil isn't immediately running out, particularly if one looks at unconventional resource bases, but the costs definitely are, and particularly where the best assets are locked up by national oil companies, companies like yours, um, uh, private sector companies, are having to get more and more innovative, ingenious, but spend more in going into riskier places to get the oil. Um, give us the outlook and what do you see in your scenarios? Well, man, many thanks, Vijay, and first I'd just like to say, full agreement with Khalid that the geopolitics has been with us since the internal combustion engine was invented and I think since Churchill um, converted the British Navy to oil from coal. It is always there, it's unpredictable, it's always a factor, but it tends to be short term in, in, in its immediate impact. The long term drivers are a combination of technology, demand, how that, that, that develops, and uh, particularly in, the, in recent years, you alluded to a competitive environment, new competitors. So yes, for 40 years now, we've been looking out typically 30 to 50 years as to what are consistent ways in which demand, supply technology, societal uh, attitudes and approaches to energy how they may develop and developing internally consistent scenarios against which we, we test strategies. The, the, the last few rounds of that, that thinking have been clear about a couple of things, demographics and economic growth in the developing world, the two billion people not yet born, the, the three billion people moving into being consumers of energy, that's where demand will be driven from. It will not be driven in Europe or, or the US. Mm. So that's where we have to look about how is energy consumed. And we need everything. It's not a question of fossil fuels or solar and wind. We as uh, humanity, we need huge efficiency improvements and all sources of supply and to fundamentally change the way we consume energy. So we, we find it difficult to create a consistent scenario in which fossil fuels by the middle of the the century are not at, at least 50% of the total energy demand, which in itself may be 50, 60% higher than today. However, it is clear that alternatives and solar, we believe, will play a very big role, whatever the scenario, and potentially in the even longer term, a dominant role. Uh, but in, in the interim period, all other sources will be required. And what we uh, need to look to as a company, you're very right, is technology and innovation to keep the cost down so that the products that we are involved in supplying are actually affordable, that they're acceptable to society and they form part of a, a secure energy supply because that's the other thing that's not come up, the importance of security 
of energy supply. Sure. Balancing all of those is part of what we need to do in our longer term thinking. So, so I'm, I'm hearing that you know, we're going to see a, a portfolio approach, as it's been talked about, uh, a variety of uh, options, including solar, which I know that Chairman Guo is very keen to talk about, and we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, um, his ambitious plans for China and solar. Um, but a strong role, continued role, for fossil fuels is what I heard from you. Indeed, although I would tend to agree with Khaled, the problem with, or the challenge for oil is not so much supply, it's likely to be demand. Mm -hmm. We see demand peaking most likely before uh, the, the and supply. Indeed, you know, it, we, there's talk of peak car, as it's been called, in indeed. the uh, OECD, in the developed economies. In, uh, and the shocking thing, I, I speak as, a, as an American, uh, that younger Americans don't always want to get their first car. It's part of American <laughs> cultural in, tradition. Uh, and it's actually, you're seeing a, a car ownership or drivership yep. dropping in the Europe's US. Europe's demand for oil peaked in 2006. Right. It's entirely possible the same will happen in the US. All the growth is in developing markets. Right. What we are seeing is demand for gas is growing more quickly for a variety of reasons, cheapness, environmental acceptability, and it is, once established an infrastructure, it is a secure Well, on the point of, of um, uh, when you, with the, sticking with the point about, again, the forecasts, um, uh, is it really uh, going to be a century for gas, um, or, or could we see a revival of, of King Coal uh, returning? Uh, and we see, in, again, numerous developing countries, particularly, coal remains abundant, and as of yet, not significant uh, efforts at things like carbon pricing, although there are pilot reforms, including in China, uh, carbon mm -hmm. trading and so on. Uh, coal is uh, ubiquitous uh, as a, a source. Uh, what is the internal thinking at your firm? Uh, as, as a default, absent uh, an appropriate mechanism for either carbon pricing or appropriate pricing of the other pollutants associated with coal, coal is one of the cheapest ways of producing electric power in many countries around the world. Right. And it, yes, coal is making a comeback in aggregate, uh, partly because of China and India, uh, but also in certain countries like Germany, where you know, bizarrely carbon dioxide emissions are going up because of, well, should we say, confused policy. Phasing out of nuclear, among other things, phase out of perhaps excessive renewables policies that were done in the wrong way. And coal being the only thing that will fill the gap. Right. Uh, let me turn to um, uh, Lin Boxiang. We, we've talked about the role of coal. Can you give us, um, as, as a deep thinker on China's energy system, um, what is the outlook for coal in China, which is a central question. Uh, there are a number of people in this room who are very concerned about climate change, for example. And it has been said that if China does not come to grips with how it uses coal and whether it uses coal, global efforts at climate change uh, management will come to nothing. Okay. Um, uh, tell me what you uh, think about coal in China. Uh, that, let's look at a general picture. Uh, coal has been down in the primary energy mix, has been down by roughly 1% per year over the last three years. And um, because of the current environmental uh, air pollution cleanup, I would believe that the coal will continue to go down uh, in 1% per year, at least uh, in the as until, a share of the energy mix. As a share of the energy mix by 2020. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is for two reasons. One is that you look at natural gas from Russia, uh, that's a huge amount of it. Right. Uh, so the natural gas in the next five to six years is going to double roughly. Mm -hmm. to Right now it's about 6%. It could possibly go to 11% to 12%. So that's about roughly 5% there. Another uh, commitment from government is that by 2020, non-fossil fuel will be... 15%. Right now, it's, last number I checked is only 9.8%. Right. So it means that from now until 2020, the government need to have another at least 5% of the non-fossil fuel. Put these two together, the curve will go down by 10%. Mm -hmm. So if it's 65.7% now, you go down to 55%. It's a far, it really overachieved the government target. The original target is 60%. By, uh, by, by 2020. Given the overall growth of the economy and the energy intensity of the economy, that will still mean China will probably burn more coal in absolute terms, but the share of the energy mix will moderate. Is that what I'm hearing? I think that's a good, very good question. Uh, I believe that uh, we did the research. We believe that the energy consumption, the coal consumption peak could come between 2020 to 2022, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, what I mean is that uh, uh, if that comes, that means the expansion of coal in absolute terms will stop. In that and that is why China is right. actually looking at the carbon cap at this moment. 
in that time frame for your analysis, yes. uh, which is the stronger forcing function? Is it carbon pricing driven by concerns about climate change or external pressure and so on? Or is it domestic concerns about air quality, uh, air pollution, which is a very powerful of residence amongst Chinese citizens? Well, you can talk about all regions. So which do you think is more right. likely to be the driver? Uh, I believe the two, two factors I mentioned, just mentioned earlier, natural gas and, re and renewables, mm -hmm. non-force of fear, it will be 10%. You drop coal down all the way down to 55. Right. And that is come from slow economic growth, environmental cleanup, right. low carbon development, okay. all put together. Okay. Well, we, we've mentioned, um, I, perhaps uh, Chairman Guo make his comments in Chinese. I encourage you all to uh, use headsets if you need them. Um, if I can ask, the, um, ask him, uh, on the comments that have been made about uh, the prospect for renewables, can you share with us uh, what are your goals? I know you've put some ambitious targets for 2020 on the table recently in your capacity as a leader for the industry. Um, uh, can you give us uh, your vision for something like 2020? for renewables coming out of China. Uh, when Mr. Lin talk about the energy uh, restructuring, uh, the proportion of uh, coal will be uh, declined. And we're working toward that direction. As I said, uh, I will talk about solar energy. Every year, they installed capacity, newly installed capacity is about uh, uh, four or five gigabat. By 2020, China's solar installed capacity can reach 150 uh, gigabat, uh, gigawatt. And also, uh, the wind energy in China is also uh, increasing uh, by a dozen of uh, gigawatt every year. So uh, by 2020, it will reach 200 gigawatt. Uh, altogether, uh, solar and uh, wind, uh, wind energy can contribute to uh, 350 gigawatt. And the contribution will increase from uh, one point something percent to five percent of the whole energy consumption in China. So as Mr. Lin pointed out, that uh, coal proportion will be down by one percent every year. If the Chinese government can adhere to this path uh, to continue to restructure the energy mix, then the uh, coal proportion will be going down even faster uh, because uh, uh, LNG and uh, nuclear energy can also contribute to this uh, proportion change. So uh, maybe uh, from now to 2020, the coal consumption can have like a 5 to 10 percent of a uh, reduction. Coal in China's energy structure uh, should be bring, brought down to less than 50%. In this way, we can change the Chinese energy structure totally based on coal. Uh, we can have a diversified energy structure. Thank you. Um, uh, within that framework of your ambitions, um, I do have a question for you about the industry itself. Now, um, you know, the uh, solar industry in China has had its challenges, uh, including some companies with financial difficulties. Um, uh, the structure of government subsidies is being reconsidered. Can you tell me what lessons have been learned um, from the troubled period of recent years so that the industry can move on a stronger footing to achieve these ambitions? I want to talk about two aspects. A lot of uh, colleagues in the solar sector um, comment that uh, solar energy will not be the core uh, energy because it's too expensive. But I can tell you clearly that the cost of uh, solar energy is uh, quickly going down. In past decade, uh, the solar energy cost was down by 80% by 2020 or maybe uh, 2022. Uh, the cost of solar energy will be uh, even down by half compared with the current level. So the uh, cost will be uh, that of the natural gas. If in coastal regions in uh, 2020, the, uh, the solar power uh, cost can be brought to uh, 0.5 RMB per kilowatt hour, then the cost will be almost like the coal-fired power plant. In this way, we we'll enjoy even bigger development room. That's the first thing. Second, uh, in the past, people see a lot of challenges and uh, bankruptcy in the solar sector. But I think uh, there are some good news as well. 
Of course, there are some bad news because of the bankruptcy of uh, uh, the companies. It has impact on the investors' uh, interest or the banks. But the good news is. Uh, uh, this is uh, inevitable, the survival of the fittest law uh, in uh, any industry's development. So uh, in a fierce competition, uh, through the management improvement or the technology advancement, some companies can survive and they can uh, push forward this uh, uh, sector development. So it's a survival of the fittest process. If uh, with this uh, reshuffle, uh, some companies can survive, then in a new development stage, these companies will be very strong. And also, we hope that in the future development, billet uh, capacity or efficiency, uh, anybody entering this sector should be optimistic, but uh, they should not be blindly optimistic uh, to af avoid the fluctuation in the sector. So we're still going to see ups and downs. That that that, that I can uh, the, the market's principles still work. Um, which do you think will be more important for your industry going forward? Uh, the role that technological innovation can play in reducing costs or the continued support of a favorable regulation and subsidies? Uh, I think uh, in countries like uh, uh, Japan and uh, Europe, U.S. and also China, uh, the laws and regulations is already there. It's uh, uh, There is a, cl a clear framework on uh, regulations. So I think uh, technology advancement to bring down the cost matters more. But of course, in developing or emerging countries such as the Middle East, uh, Latin America, but of course, the policy still matters more. And it will push forward the market development. As it were, um, there are trade disputes going on um, between China and Europe and separately with the U.S. Uh, related to your industry. What is the likely outcome of these? How do you see the end game here? Yes, we are uh, faced with a lot of uh, uh, trade disputes concerning the panel sector. Uh, it's uh, happening more frequently. But uh, um, I think it's harmful for the utilization of solar power. Uh, Europe uh, used to be the largest market uh, with uh, 18 gigawatt of uh, install capacity every year. But after the anti-dumping and anti-counterfeiting uh, dispute with China, the, uh, the price of uh, European market is very high. Now the uh, annual install capacity was down to 8 gigawatt every year. So it's actually uh, harmful for the uh, industry development. Uh, notice to the audience, uh, I, I want to come to you for your questions um, fairly soon. So please start collecting your thoughts. We have some microphone runners who can come to you. But um, uh, with that advance notice, let me uh, press my panelists on one further topic, and that is um, unconventional hydrocarbons. We've made some mention of them. Uh, maybe um, I can start with you, um, Khaled. If you can tell me, uh, what is the outlook for um, uh, shale and tight gas? I gather you are investing in some of this in your own territory. But globally, there's something of a revolution that's seen. Um, can you talk to us about what this means? Well, within the kingdom, first of all, let me, let me say that we're really uh, excited about the opportunities that have been opened up with the developments uh, within North America. We're, the kingdom already uses gas significantly. It's about 50% of our electric generation is from gas, and we're looking to take that to 70%, 80%, because the other half is all liquids, all oil, very the opportunity cost for it is uh, significant going forward, and we want to do that switch as rapidly as possible. So we have a, a huge program of exploration, development, conventional, unconventional, gas onshore, offshore, and the early results are very promising. We have two major projects being developed today for uh, non-associated conventional gas that will take our capacity up by 20, 30 percent, and then we have three different areas of tight gas, shale gas, as well as some uniquely, 
to our geology uh, gas channels that are unconventional, which will be brought on stream, all of them within the next three to four years. So the opportunities are huge. We have to build up, of course, a special type of industry to do that cost effectively. What, what's your incentive? Uh, you're sitting on such a, uh, easy money. Why would you invest in the hard stuff? Well, it's the long term. Uh, really, our, our incentive is to save uh, valuable liquids that are going to be needed for future generations. Like I said, our costs of producing and delivering liquids to our consumers within the kingdom are in the single digits. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, by investing through the value chain, including refined products. Uh, but gas uh, is the right way uh, to go. We, mm. we, have, we have the resources also <coughs> in abundance. I think when I look globally, uh, the resource base of gas and oil is going to allow the world a much more orderly transition uh, to the world we talked about from over-dependence on fossil fuels to a mixed energy mix to ultimately uh, easing out completely from fossil fuel. But you need a long, long time to make that transition. And I think having the security and the peace of mind that we have such an abundance of resources that can be brought to the market <coughs> with the technologies available, with also good economic opportunities being availed by the industry, jobs being created, materials being uh, being procured by the oil and gas industry. So there is also a spillover economic effect to anywhere where these developments take place. China, where we are today, has even more resources, uh, geologically speaking, than the United States. And the question is, will China, through appropriate policy, supply chain, and, and market <coughs> development, be able to access its resources in time to achieve the environmental and economic objectives it has? And I believe it will. I think if you look at... Well, well let, let me take up that question, though. That's uh, uh, of great interest to many people in the world, the development of China's unconventionals. Uh, uh, China has, uh, maybe I'll ask my gentleman here, whichever one of you wants to jump in, China has enormous resources um, in shale, um, but the geography is more complex than, than, for example, in the United States where it took off. The business model is quite different. Uh, water questions become quite um, challenging. Um, can um, either of you who's looked at this question give me a, a, an answer on... In the next decade, are we really going to see a significant takeoff here? Uh, right now, I think it seems to me it's a bit slow. We have a target of 6.5 billion by, by this year. Last year, I look at it, it's only 200 million. So it's pretty far away from the, uh, from the government's target. This year, somebody believed that we have some breakthrough. We have more numbers coming out. However, overall, I still believe that we do not put enough sufficient resources into net shale gas development. The reason I'm saying that is that, uh, look, just look at what that a lot of talk, no question about it. But you look at reality, how many people are actually doing it? Mm -hmm. That is really uh, not sufficient number there. You said resource. What is the main obstacle, in your opinion? What the, the, that, that's something is really, really puzzle to many people, because uh, we are short of natural gas, no question about it. There's shortage there. We have a high natural gas price compared to the United States mm -hmm. for these matters. We, are, we need environmental cleanup, which requires substantial natural. I mean, that what we, we really need it, so urgent need it. Government comes up with a subsidy for it. Mm -hmm. Why there's not many people there? Do you have an answer? We yes, I do have an answer. answer. Yes. Uh, I believe there is uncertainty. If, for example, if I'm a private company in the United States, all I need to do is to dig up the gas, shell gas, with least cost. That's all I need to worry about. Going through a pipeline, going to the market, there's, not, there's nothing to worry about. But in China, of course, we did the natural gas. That because there's a different technolo technology must be moving from US to China, uh, require innovations right. and also some adjustments. So there's some technical Right, risk. technical one. A technical one is related to the, to the uncertainties. Right. Because with uh, so not sufficient people in the field, Let's say 10 people try to figure out technology issues, solutions. It's right. different from 1,000 people trying to figure it out. Right. So it's, but the reason not many people in it is because of uncertainties. For example, I'm the private company. Right. I need to try to figure out how to take the sale gas out. But what about ownership? Mm -hmm. That's one question. Go through the pipelines. Right now, it's monopolized by the, by the three major oil companies. Right. And of course, they promise that there will be no discrimination. But how do I believe that? 
we are in the same line. We are going through the same fraud, and we are going to the same market. How do I believe that there is no discrimination? Right. Why not go to the market? It's supposed to be market price. That's what government promised. But unfortunately, government promised on the market price and energy. The record is really not too good there. So mm. put everything together, I think there's uncertainty there. But uncertainty okay. lead to a delay in the investment decisions in enthusiastic you know, participation. So it sounds like there's start. as much right. risk above the ground as there is below the ground. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, a follow, quick follow-on on that, and then I'm going to come to the audience. Yeah. Uh, I think Mr. Lin is absolutely right on the main factors. I'd add a couple of other uh, points, though. In, in China, we drill 50 wells. There's only a few hundred wells in total drilled in shale in, for unconventional gas. Uh, in the North American environment, there are 10,000 wells a year being drilled every year. So well over 100,000 already being drilled in the last few years. And there's just so much more information. And then the infrastructure exists to get to market. So that reduces the level of uncertainty. And in fact, it's quite likely the geology, as well as the geography, is actually more uncertain in China. So we need more activity, more information, more understanding of what it will take to bring the molecules up, and then I'm, I'm absolutely convinced China will build the infrastructure. Mm. But you can't build the infrastructure ahead of right. knowing what it is you have. And it's having 1,500 to 2,000 active rigs at any given time in North America that has meant that the US is today still the only serious shale gas and shale liquids producer. Is there an additional element? Um, uh, I mean, Shell is one of the world's great uh, oil majors. You've had great success in many places. But along with other majors, um, you were not in the leading edge of the shale gas revolution in America. That's a story of the scrappy underdog of George Mitchell and, and the uh, uh, entrepreneurial guys who were willing to take risks that were seen as either too small or too high for the big companies. Um, if we were to take that lesson away from the American shale revolution, what is the analog here in China? Are the right kinds of risk models, that is business models, uh, being applied yet? Or do you have some lessons learned that you are applying here that can help overcome that issue? Well, I think the comparison between the US and even Canada and the rest of the world uh, includes the rest of the world, not just China. And that is the incentives <clears throat> for small players to actually go after and take the risk, go after the prize, uh, are, are, are different. The landowners, the individual um, operators, sometimes literally a, a family company, could hire a rig and drill and get to market quickly because things were known about the, uh, the geology because everywhere had already been drilled and the market was certain. So it does need more activity and probably a more vibrant approach in terms of not just state-owned or large companies, but you need both, I think, in the other, other mm -hmm. countries because you need technology, you need operational capability, you need access to the infrastructure, and that will only come through the larger com companies. So I think China is, it, it is doing its best to get a long-term view about how best to develop this, uh, but it's certainly true that the dynamism, the innovation, the entrepreneurial animal spirit in the US is a huge factor to the, first of all, rapid development, but also the widespread development and that is actually quite difficult to replicate elsewhere mm -hmm. because it, it's part of the way America does things. Right. As promised, I'm going to turn to you, our uh, uh, collective uh, wisdom. Let me see some hands on people who want to ask questions. OK. Um, let me maybe come here to the front row here. There's a hand. Uh, let's get a microphone. Just, again, some ground rules. Please identify yourself and your affiliation. And, and please make it a question rather than a long-winded statement. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> likes a gas bag. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much. Tatsu Masa from uh, Japan, I'm teaching in Nagoya. I have a question to Simon Henry. This debate covers short term, long term, and very long, long term. One of the comments made by Simon is solar energy may play a dominant role in future. So if that happened, what would be the fate of hydrocarbons we are enjoying today? And what would be the time frame that solar energy may play a dominant role? in the world. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. We, we would see it really being the second half of the century, and it depends on certain choices made in policy terms and the rate of development of technology. 
I think Mr. Gao is correct that the, the cost of any given unit of capacity is potentially in the next decade one-tenth of the cost that it was until quite recently. Uh, but there's a huge installed capacity uh, in the energy industry in general. One and a half trillion dollars a year is already invested in the energy industry, of which uh, maybe two to three hundred billion is going into solar and wind, uh, even today. So th there's a massive investment required to make a huge difference. So for, that's why we see fossil fuel pertaining for a very long time. The other question is, although solar is very strong in, in potentially in the power market, it's a bit more difficult in the transport market um, or, or in certain other uh, areas of energy consumption. So liquid fuels we see is remaining by far the, the strongest uh, and, and best placed uh, economic solution for transport well, simply because of energy density. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned um, that topic. Uh, with all the, the buzz around Tesla in, in the Western world, uh, the Chinese government's interest in electrification of vehicles, local champions that have like BYD here. Um, what is the forecast you guys are working with on uh, electric vehicles uh, as part of the car fleet uh, going out 2030, 2050? Uh, it's a little similar to solar. It depends a little bit on, on the rate of development of technology and then on the capacity to, to build. Yes, electric vehicles will play a role. It's difficult to see that being a major one in the next 10 to 15 years. Biofuels, we see... Well, fleet turnover uh, takes time, obviously. Indeed. But it, that's why if you push to, it out to, to 2030, years. 2050... Uh, what do you at the moment, electric cars need, in general, quite a lot more subsidy than solar does. Mm. Solar is approaching grid parity. Uh, electric vehicles are some way from that. And particularly, it's only at the, the, the passenger car level. It's not at the truck or, or the bus, which is a major part of the transport fuel demand as well. Uh, at the heavier end of transport, gas, liquefied gas, natural gas, is becoming, particularly here in China, an alternative, as the Chinese we see as being in the lead in this, this part of the future transport fuel segment, uh, with the Americans and the Europeans also looking to develop that. Well, how do you would, see the threat from EVs, well, it, I, if at I, all? I, I don't see it as a threat. I agree with Simon that it's going to play a role, small role initially, and growing um, over time, but I think we have to link it to the discussion taking place earlier about the energy mix. Mm. If you are in a country like China, where coal is the dominant fuel for electricity, then uh, it's a counterproductive switch because you're increasing demand for electricity, and electricity is primarily coal-based, so the electricity demand curve is going up even steeper. And given the tightness in, in gas and the limitations of renewables, I think you're ending up with a more carbon intensive energy mix than you would have if you've gone for efficient hybrids that are uh, petroleum based until technologies uh, on renewables develop and become competitive so that you can shift significantly the energy mix away from coal. So, the convenience is another factor. Also, if you're talking about cars and the tens of millions and the subsidies that are required uh, and the battery manufacturing process is going to also be draining on, on the economy, on material supply. So I think there are a lot of uh, wrinkles that have to be ironed out before we declare that electrification will solve mobility. Um, uh, we hear uh, a great, uh, I would say, uh, caution or skepticism about the prospects of uh, electric vehicles or alternative drive vehicles disrupting the, the internal combustion engine paradigm as it stands. Um, uh, I would offer a thought, having written a book on this topic, uh, that disruption happens in ways that one doesn't expect. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would watch uh, energy storage, uh, a huge area of uh, scientific and technological investment. If we were to see advances in this area, I think our conversation would be different when we meet five or ten years hence. Uh, uh, and that could lead to not, all, not just electricity, but possibly a variety of fuels uh, or other options that come up. But let me get back to the audience. Yes, let me come on this side here, not neglect those behind me. Uh, again, identify yourself, sir. Hi, Ken, Ken from uh, Myanmar. Uh, I'm, I'm in the energy sector. So the, uh, there's the, the energy mix, the movement in the energy mix and then the, the, the monopoly 
against the monopoly of the uh, this the inner pipeline structure. So how that how does it impact the uh, reg regional demand on the this the the, uh, the natural gas and then the the, the landscape for the uh, the LNG uh, development projects regionally and the the last uh, lastly the the price of the LNG in Asia. Sounds like a question for you, Simon. Okay, thank th thank you. And today the gas. The global gas market is around maybe two-thirds of the size of the oil market, but growing at 3 4% a year. Of that, LNG is only around 10% of the total. The rest is basically pipeline. These are in revenue terms um, or in volume, volume, volume terms. Uh, okay. Volume equivalent. Because LNG is priced at a great yeah, premium. Ener yeah. Energy yeah. equivalent. Yeah. So the, the gas market is growing quickly, and LNG is an important part of it because LNG is leading to a more global approach to pricing. So there is some equalization of pricing that was not there five years ago even because there was not enough supply that had a choice about where to go. Now could pipeline, we, see, could pipe, we see gas oh. as a fungible global commodity the way oil is um, 10 years hence? Longer term, that, that is looking entirely possible mm. indeed. But pipeline will always have a cost advantage. So it will be more at the margin in terms of... Uh, part of a portfolio of energy mix. Uh, the, regional, uh, the, the regional pipelines, Russia is a big player, and the Middle East could choose to create pipelines, e.g. from Iran into Pakistan, India, to, to the major population centers. Uh, and then Russia into Europe is the other one. The Americas will stay as a self-contained gas island in that sense, but we do see an equalization of gas prices over time. And that will drive, we think, access to infrastructure, which increasingly will follow an American or European model that the owner of the infrastructure has to make it available at equal access to any user. And that's something that many developing countries, including China, have not yet reached that stage, but are, I think are quite likely to do so in the not too distant future. Now, we have seen get, uh, oil used as a political weapon historically. Um, could we see as sometimes Europeans in the middle of winter fear, gas uses um, a political weapon in anything more than saber rattling. Uh, of course, I'm talking about Russia and, and Gazprom in um, its relations with its immediate neighbors. We've seen this, but in terms of much longer term, <laughs> um, uh, pr uh, is this something that uh, to worry about? You know, I think, I think the collective wisdom of uh, the world today is to avoid using oil and gas uh, in political uh, conflicts. People aren't always wise in the well, political elections. <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope that we've learned the lesson. I think, yeah. I think from the experiences when it was used, it has backfired mm. and it has been counterproductive to the interests uh, of producers. And likewise, countries that have markets, uh, I think, are better served by opening uh, their markets and attracting uh, and interdependence with, uh, with suppliers. So I am personally a believer in open markets, open trade, and letting uh, suppliers uh, of energy, consumers of energy, not only have these long-term trade relationships that serve the interest of both, but co-invest in a ways that tie their interests together. And that basically shapes our strategies around the world. Wherever we go, we try not only to be a reliable supplier of oil, which is, which is what we do, but we try to invest uh, in the well-being and in the robustness of the market that we are supplying and become part of the landscape. This is our strategy here in China. We're doing the same with Shell in the US, in Japan. We're doing it in Korea and elsewhere. Uh, and the same thing, I believe, would, would go for gas suppliers. We're not one of them, but others, I believe, would see the wisdom of, uh, of that choice. Yeah, we, we see that mutual interdependence as the best mitigant against the, the conflict situations you described. And remember, the Middle East has never failed to supply oil. And actually, Russia, throughout the entire Cold War, never failed to supply gas to Europe right. either. Well, that's the thing about pipelines, isn't it? Uh, uh, the interdependence goes both ways. Uh, if you are piping the gas, you're also reliant on your customer for money. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I think that uh, supports your argument. And let's have another question. Um, we'll come to this third of the room, maybe the lady in the front row here. We get a microphone. 
Please Hi. identify yourself. Sure. Ines Azevedo, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, the, the panel has talked about uh, a growing demand of the portfolio of technologies and sources that are going to indeed be needed. The pace of transitions in the energy infrastructure is extraordinarily slow. We put out electric power plants that are going to be around for six years. So what the panel has not commented on is climate policy. Are we doomed? <laughs> right? <laughs> climate policies. Are we doomed? <laughs> Who wants to take the bait? All right, okay, go ahead. I You're think there's some good news, uh, at least from China. We used to uh, have the largest incremental in the, in the CO2 emissions. But since the last year and moving forward in the next few years, the incremental is going to be substantially slowed down. And if we can reach the coal consumption P by 2020, assuming that happens, then you are going to see that China come up with a cap for CO2 after 2020 because they become feasible. And that'll be we, done through domestic mechanisms, not as part of international treaties and negotiations. Right, Am I right? right. Because it's very easy to figure it out. Once the coal stop and we can we begin to add the clean energy into the system, it's obviously you can reach the peak. Right. Not that difficult. So I would say that there's some good news, at least from part of China. And that's, that's a big news. Again, how much of that is driven by policy versus a slowdown in the economy? I think both. But I think the policy is stronger than the slowdown you economy. Do. Because okay. even slowdown, slowdown economy, China's uh, uh, energy incremental is roughly still about 4%, something like that. Right. It's about... Uh, from GDP to energy, it's about 1 to 0.4, not 4%, 3 to 4%. So that's still a substantial number. Given the current, you know, you are talking, still talking about uh, roughly 1 billion coal equivalent. That's still huge numbers. Well, so, on this yeah, point you mentioned yeah, in passing, that right. you know, we, we've had a very supply side uh, right. conversation. Right. Uh, no big surprise since we have three supply side uh, folks at the table. Um, Give me an idea of the role for uh, demand side improvements. You know, in particular, if you're talking about the linkage between energy consumption and GDP, right. uh, historically we know that as economies uh, develop, they, they tend to use less energy per input okay. of GDP. China is at that middle income point, inflection point, uh, where we could see dramatic improvements in, right. in some of these things. Uh, what are the levers that need to be uh, handled properly to, to accelerate that? What well, it really need to. Uh the government really have to be sure that uh, leaving the GDP aside from the energy. Because of the, right now, the, if you look at 30 years, energy is 1 to 0.6, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Look at 10 years, energy is 1 to 0.5. Moving forward, now 10 years, energy is 1, GDP 1, energy, primary energy 0.4. So you see the natural decline right. because of the structural changes, because of efficiency improvement, everything. However, there's a, a critical point that the government really have to look in the GDP away from the energy. The reason I'm saying that is that uh, right now the number is going quite good. But I'm worried about if GDP starts to slow down a bit, why the, the, the parties can revert back to support the GDP? That would be, uh, that right. would, could be right. questionable. Yeah. Now, you emphasize one dimension of this, that is um, structure of the economy. Right. We know that China's, uh, the rise of the services sector, the tertiary right. sector in China, next year may well be the first year in which the, the tertiary sector becomes yes. more than 50% of China's GDP. Right. In a place like Shanghai, it's already 60%. Right. Um, but there's another dimension of the same problem, that is um, urbanization. Right. China crossed the line of urbanization just a year ago, really, more than 50% of its population living in cities. Um, as Simon, I know this is a topic you've thought about, energy use and urbanization. Uh, depending on how cities are put together with transport and um, uh, infrastructure options, it can either be heaven or hell when it comes to energy. Um, want to share a thought on what might be the smart ways forward? Well, certainly we would agree that as it's quite likely by the middle of the century, 80% of energy demand will be in urban environments, that how cities are designed, buildings are constructed, how transport systems are designed, uh, and really a policy framework to create that, uh, the right outcome, will be hugely influential, not only on how much energy, but what kind of energy is developed. And maybe Mr. Gao has uh, some views on how solar can play into that, for example, in you know, building construction using PV uh, photovoltaic type materials. Uh, either of you want to follow up? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was just going to say that the policy on the environmental issue the lady is concerned about is going to be impacted in every country by local politics. 
So what is uh, the issue of localization around the energy uh, supply infrastructure and, uh, and industry? Uh, you know, solar, uh, a lot of the friction that we talked about earlier in trade is actually driven by desires and countries that are switching to solar to build their own uh, solar industry. Coal producers are going to resist. You know, the mining industry is going to resist. So a global framework will have to come to a, a lowest common denominator, unfortunately, where governments around the table are driven to, to a large degree by their local political uh, landscapes. And therefore, I think there is an opportunity for industry to take the lead, mm -hmm. not wait for a global framework to develop, but take initiatives on, on our own that are leading in that direction. Again, using technology, innovation, pre-investing for a future that is less carbon intensive. We're doing a lot of this, not only on the supply side, which we've talked about, but also on the demand side. We're investing with and researching with the auto industry on doing radical improvements or achieving radical improvements in efficiency of petroleum-based vehicles, on capturing carbon mm. on, on the automobile, on converting that carbon to uh, a useful, marketable product. This may be far-fetched today, but if you pre-invest and commit resources to them, again, looking at a world 15, 20 years from now where we need to reduce the carbon intensity, I, I believe it can be done. Great. Let me see. Uh, look, uh, please, go ahead. Gao Jifan. Okay. I think the previous speakers uh, are very reasonable. And also talk about the geopolitics and the relationship of, uh, with uh, oil and gas. I'm thinking that whether a country uh, can be uh, more autonomous or independent in energy. Uh, but uh, oil and gas uh, is out of control because, uh, for example, Russia has a lot of gas and uh, Middle East have a, have a lot of oil. But for solar, uh, most countries can uh, be autonomous. For example, German, Germany. We know that uh, there are not so much sunshine in Germany. And its total uh, consumption is very large, but its uh, land uh, area is not that large. Currently, the solar energy already uh, accounts for 15% of the total energy consumption. Why is that? I think uh, uh, our colleague here uh, said in the previous session that because of the renewable energy uh, policy, uh, that uh, the European energy price is high, uh, so it's not comparable to the United States. But in the future 10 years, uh, it, still, it will have a competitive uh, um, uh, price edge. Uh, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, in a few years, time, uh, maybe uh, for solar energy, its cost will be even lower than, than uh, oil and gas. So we can create a new energy mix based on solar. It can contribute to the energy independence. Uh, it can help the country to import less oil and gas. Uh, Chairman Gao, because you have given a provocative idea, and we're almost out of time. Your provo provocative idea is that the, the Saudi Arabia will be a superpower in solar energy. <laughs> and, and, and like that uh, great idea, I want to go around to the rest of my panelists in the two minutes I have remaining and challenge you to put forward one provocative idea drawn from our conversation that we can all leave with um, uh, to take away with in a sentence or two. Well, first of all, to respond, we are uh, investing also uh, in solar technology, and Saudi Arabia is intent of being a superpower in solar. We have a number of research projects already ongoing within, uh, within the kingdom, and we as an oil company have set our strategy to be a broad energy uh, company, and solar will be somehow within our portfolio. Now, give us an insight from the past hour that you will take away with you or you want us to take away, something that um, struck you during our conversation. Well, I think, I think the idea of fossil fuels going down to 50% uh, is provocative, and, and uh, we know today it's, uh, 
uh, much higher than this, but I would also add to this that the energy consumption by the middle of the century is going to be also twice as much as it is now. So the demand on fossil fuels remains huge. The decline rate... So Aramco will still be in business? Not only this, <laughs> but I think the industry... My concern is not about Aramco. My concern is about the audience and sure. policymakers yeah. not realizing the amount of investment that has to be put in place to achieve that declining percentage of fossil fuel in a world that is going to require a lot more energy. It's in the trillions of dollars, and that requires not only our industry, but our supply chain, talent, all of that has to be chan uh, channeled to producing that energy that the world needs and needs it sustainably. So investment in technology and innovation has to go hand in hand with, with uh, the production of that energy. Khaled al Fali, thank you. Simon Henry, a provocation. That's a, a good question. I always think coming to China makes you stretch the, uh, the limits of uh, imagination. And uh, you can hear from the, the, the discussion that the best way of protecting against being doomed in an industry that invests for very long times is to take coal out of the, uh, the energy equation. I think China is, is making some very big steps to think about how to do this. But what about the rest of the world? If we take coal out, then the CO2 problem is a quarter the size of, of what it is today. And the way to do that so is regulation? That how about that in the next 10, 15 years? You start with policy, you, em you encourage technology, whether it be solar, gas, uh, or nuclear. That, okay. that, that, that is a, a challenge. All right, I asked for provocative, we and we got for. the end of coal. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Lin Boxiang, your final word. Uh, we talk about a couple of issues, uh, three issues. One is uh, geopolitics and decarbonize the technology, and also the unconventional gas. Put everything together, I believe that uh, the structure of the energy supply globally is going to be changing. Demand also going to be changing, so that we are looking for a changing in what energy uh, and you said demand situation. will change. You don't see supply any scenario in which demand will come down. To, all going to change. It's still going to go up. Demand it's will always, up. Right, yeah. you think. And we need, we need to prepare for that. Okay. Well, that's not provocative at all, but it's a, really? it is nevertheless okay. a wise <laughs> word to, to finish on. <laughs> the world will change and be prepared for it. Very good. What, what was oh, uh, uh, we, okay. well, you started us off, but if, you ha if you're burning to, okay. very short. Okay. Xiao, xiao. Well, very briefly about technology, be it oil, coal, or uh, natural gas, in the next 15 years, uh, the trend of the technology, everybody is pretty clear. But uh, we're very uncertain about the future of the solar energy. Just as the professor said uh, from Japan, solar energy and electric cars, the future will exceed our expectations. That's why we need to uh, keep developing. We probably wouldn't know that uh, when that expression will happen. Thank you. Thank you. The, the future remains sunny. Um, from, from Chairman Gao. Thank you all. Give a round of applause for my speakers. Great. Thank you very much.